Today's lecture is on gallbladder and bile ducts. Today's lecture is divided into four parts, eh? gallbladder and bile ducts. Part one, we'll talk about the anatomy, physiology, including bilirubin metabolism and imaging. In part two, we'll talk about gallstone and the related diseases of the gallbladder. In part three, we'll talk about the other diseases of the gallbladder, including bile duct strictures, gallbladder polyps, and malignancy. And in part four, we'll briefly go into cholecystectomy, its indications, surgery, proper, and complications. Okay, now we look at the surgical anatomy of the biliary system. The biliary system consists of uh, two parts. One is the gallbladder and the other one is the bile ducts. The gallbladder consists of the fundus, body, neck and the heartburn pouch and finally the cystic duct. Whereas the bile ducts consists of the right and left hepatic ducts, the common hepatic duct and the CBD. And these two systems are connected by the cystic duct as shown in this diagram here. Okay, this is the gallbladder, fundus, body, heartburn pouch and the neck. And the, this is the cystic duct, which connects the gallbladder to the biliary ducts, which consists of a right and left uh, hepatic ducts joining to form the common hepatic duct, which in turn joins by the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. And this common bile duct goes downwards and to the right to join, enter into the second part of the duodenum. The surface anatomy of the gallbladder is very important in, when you examine the patient, it is very important to localize the exact site of the gallbladder. Now, what are the landmarks that uh, can be used to locate the gallbladder? First, is the, it is located at the right upper chondrium, as indicated by this ring, number one. Next, you have the transpyloric plane, number two here which is a horizontal plane at the level of the lower border of L1 vertebral body. Then the third is your midclavicular line, number three here, a vertical line from the midline of the clavicle. Okay. And fourthly, the angle between the right costal margin and the lateral border of the rectus abdominis. Normally, it is not palpable, but if the gallbladder is palpable, it is abnormal. Now we come to Kellogg's triangle. Okay, the Kellogg's triangle is this grey shaded area here in the region of the gallbladder and the bile ducts. Eh? Its boundaries are lateral border, the cystic duct and the gallbladder, the medial border, the common hepatic duct and its branch, the right hepatic uh, duct, and uh, the superior border is your lower surface or inferior surface of your right lobe of your liver. It is important to know the contents of the uh, hepatic uh, collapse triangle, which consists of the right hepatic artery and its branch, the cystic artery, which supplies the gallbladder. It's also a, a limb node, which is located in the center of this triangle, and this is known as the cystic limb node of Lund, which drains the gallbladder is the primary limb node that drains the gallbladder. This is the anatomy of the gallbladder, uh, CBD, or common bile duct. Okay? It's divided into four parts. It's about 7.5 centimeters long and about 6 millimeters in diameter. So this is a very important figure, 6 millimeters. Anything more than that is considered dilated. It consists of four parts. Okay, the four, first part is known as the supraduodenal part here, above the duodenum, where it is formed. Okay, it's about 2.5 centimeters long. Second part is the retroduodenal part behind the first part of the duodenum. The third part is the infraduodenal part. Okay, infraduodenal or transpancreatic uh, part on the posterior surface of the head of the pancreas. And the uh, fourth one is the intraduodenal part, uh, the part that enters the 
to the wall of the second part of the duodenum. It opens the second part of the duodenum as the ampulla of water. Okay, and ends on the summit of the uh, for summit known as the papilla, which is identified on endoscopy. Okay, now close-up view of the ampulla of water and the spinter of OD. Eh? This is the fourth part of the uh, CBD, eh? which is formed by ampulla of water is formed by the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct within the uh, wall of the second part of the duodenum. It ends at the sphincter of OD, and this is uh, a circular muscle that covers the, the tip of the ampulla of water, which controls the flow of bile and pancreatic juice into the duodenum. Okay, it's a muscular valve. Eh? This is a very important uh, structure, especially in ERCP and sphincterotomy, where the sphincter of OD is to be identified as the papilla. Okay. Okay. This, now we come to the physiology of the gallbladder and the bile ducts. Okay. At the liver, the bile is produced, and the production of bile, the bile constitutes ninety-seven percent of water, one to two percent bile salts. 1% bile pigments, cholesterol, calcium, and fatty acids. It is excreted at, at around 40 mils per hour, which works out to be around 1 liter in 24 hours. Okay. At the gallbladder, three main functions take place. Okay. The gallbladder uh, acts as a reservoir for bile, uh, to storage of bile during fasting when the bile is not required. The concentration of bile is the another function of the gallbladder. It concentrates the bile to as high as 5 to 10 times by active reabsorption of the water. And it also produces mucin at around 20 mils per hour to lubricate the gallbladder. And as far as the neuroendocrine control is concerned, it is dependent on the vagus and cholecystokinin or CCK. Okay, so when uh, the food is ent uh, enters into the duodenum, the vagus and cholecystokinin help to contract the gallbladder and the sphincter of OD to relax at the same time. Okay, and this synchronization of gallbladder contraction and relaxation of the sphincter of OD results in the excretion of uh, into the duodenum. Okay, in this slide, we look at the bilirubin metabolism in normal individuals. Eh? Okay. In this uh, chemical pathway, there are three main uh, phases. The prehepatic phase, the intrahepatic phase, and the post-hepatic phase. In the prehepatic phase, which takes place in the circulation, the RBCs are destroyed in the spleen mainly, and this creates, uh, produces unconjugated bilirubin. And this unconjugated bilirubin is uh, non-water soluble. It is absorbed into the hepatocytes in the liver in the intrahepatic phase, where the unconjugated bilirubin is conjugated to glucuronic acid, and that results in conjugated bilirubin, or CB as mentioned here. Conjugated bilirubin is then secreted into the bile ducts, and these bile ducts carry the conjugated bilirubin into the small intestine, where the bacteria act on it to con and convert it to urobilinogen and stercobilinogen. Stercobilinogen is excreted in the feces, which gives the normal brown color to stools. A small amount, 10% of this urobilinogen, enters into the enterohepatic circulation between the uh, small intestine and the liver through the portal circulation. And some of this little uh, urobilinogen is uh, diffuses back into the circulation and is uh, excreted by the kidneys as urobilinogen in the urine. And usually this is found in trace amounts in the urine. 
So in summary, you have the prehepatic blood where there's unconjugated bilirubin. Then in the intrahepatic phase in the liver, it is conjugated bilirubin is formed. And this conjugated bilirubin in the post-hepatic phase in the bile ducts is carried in the bile ducts into the intestine where urobilinogen, sacobilinogen and the enterohepatic circulation are uh, encountered. Come to the imaging of the gallbladder and the bile ducts. What are the methods that are used? First, plain x-ray. Okay, the plain x-ray is a very important investigation, especially patients' uh, plain x-ray of chest x-ray and abdominal x-ray. Next important is ultrasonography. These two are the most important initial investigations of all gallbladder and bile duct diseases. Then you have computer, uh, computerized tomogram or CT scan which is necessary in some patient depending on the findings on the ultrasound. You have the MRI uh, investigation, magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography or MRCP and the endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram or ERCP. And last now, the newer in, uh, investigation sets known as ultrasonic endoscopic ultrasound or EUS is another important investigation and this is combined with biopsy for definitive diagnosis. Other investigations are listed here which many, most of them are not being used anymore among which most relevant may be a radioisotope scan. Huh? known as the HIDA scan, which refers to hepatobiliary immunodiacetic acid scan, eh, which is occasionally required in children and newborns for the diagnosis of biliary atresia or uh, cysts of the cholidocal uh, cysts. Okay, what is the use of plain x-ray in bile duct and gallbladder disease? First, only 10% of gallstones are radio-opaque. Okay, this is an important fact that must be understood. And this is a plain x-ray of the abdomen showing a gallbladder filled with radio-opaque stones. Secondly, all some gallbladders may be totally calcified and these are known as gall porcelain gallbladders okay here you see the gallbladder the whole wall is calcified and this is known as porcelain gallbladder which is believed to be a pre-malignant condition for carcinoma of the gallbladder and thirdly gas in the bile ducts also known as aerobilia okay this is usually due to infection of the bile ducts especially these days with the wide, widespread use of ERCP. Infection may be an important complication. Okay, here is a x-ray showing you aerobilia, air in the biliary tract. As I said, these days, most commonly, manipulation, ERCP and the manipulation of the uh, bile ducts is a common cause of this aerobilia. Okay, so you have gallstones, porcelain gallbladder and aerobilia or diagnosed on plain x-ray abdomen. Then we have this ultrasound. Eh? Ultrasound has become the most important preliminary investigation of all biliary conditions including gallbladder disease. Okay, Now, the most important initial imaging, it is safe, painless, accurate, convenient, cost-effective and readily available Gallstones, gallbladder, thickness of the gallbladder, uh, wall and the surrounding inflammation can all be detected by ultrasound. The size of the bile ducts can also be estimated and uh, the normal size is between 6 to 8 millimeters uh, for the CBD. And sometimes even stones in the common bile duct and growth in the pancreas can be determined by the pancreas uh, ultrasound. Okay, this is an ultrasonic picture which shows you the gallbladder here. Okay, 
and then you see the gallbladder is filled with bile, hypoechogenic, and the wall around it is hyperechogenic here, which is normal size. And here is a gallbladder, the wall is thickened. There are multiple hyperechogenic shadows within the gallbladder, which indicate stones. And these stones typically cast a posterior shadow, uh, which is a uh, diagnostic of gallstones. Okay, next we come to CT scan and MRI scan. Huh? Okay, CT scan is useful for detecting liver and pancreatic lesions. Okay, that's very important. So whenever you suspect some liver or pancreatic lesion, CT scan should be considered. It is also useful for the staging of liver, bile duct, and pancreatic cancers, and to check for enlarged lymph nodes. However, only 75% of gallstones are seen on CT scan and therefore it is not ideally ideal for screening of gallstones. Okay, so in summary, CT scan is used more for detecting mass lesions. MRCP, magnetic resonant cholangiopancreatogram, is imaging, is a good imaging method for gallbladder and bile ducts. It can show obstruction, bile duct obstruction, strictures, and other ductal abnormalities. And the last one here, and this is for mainly, and this is solely for diagnostic purposes. Eh? It cannot be used for therapeutic. Okay. Next, we come to ERCP, which is a not only diagnostic, it's therapeutic. Okay. Okay, this is a ERCP picture to show you how it is done. Okay, the scope, endoscope is passed through the mouth to the reach the second part of the duodenum. Okay, where there's a side viewing camera and this catheter is introduced through the side viewing aperture into the, the ductia. Okay, the papilla is identified and the papilla is cannulated. Okay. Then it is injected into the ampulla of water when you see a pancreatic, uh, sorry, biliary tree being identified, and this is the pancreatic duct. Okay, so you can identify the common bile duct, common hepatic ducts, and the intrahepatic biliary ducts. You can also visualize the gallbladder here. Okay, so this is a very good investigation for diagnosing intraductal problems as well as for removal of stones in the CBD. Okay, so it's both therapeutic and diagnostic. The only uh, disadvantage is it uh, needs heavy sedation and hospitalization, at least as a day case. Diseases of the biliary system. Gallbladder and bile duct. As I said, there are two components, gallbladder and bile ducts. Okay, the diseases of the gallbladder, these are the common ones, cholecystitis, biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, and chronic cholecystitis. Okay, these are considered common. Less common, empyema of the gallbladder, gangrene and perforation of gallbladder, gallbladder polyps, and these are actually the complications of gallstone disease. And of course, the most serious complication of gallstone is carcinoma of the gallbladder. Under biliary ducts, it is cholidocolitasis, cholangitis, or stricture of the bile, common bile duct, leading to obstructive jaundice. Okay, these are the common ones. Then congenital cases, biliary atresia and cholidocolitis, and then less common sclerosing cholangitis, carcinoma head of pancreas, cholangiocarcinoma, and periamplary carcinoma. The gallstone contribute 80% of the diseases of the bile ducts and gallbladder. So this is a very important condition and eh? gallstone disease. Gallbladder, biliary ducts. Now, the 
most important uh, diseases of the gallbladder will be gallstone disease or cholelithiasis. 80% of patients with gallstones are asymptomatic. Every year, about 1-2% to of asymptomatic cases develop symptoms requiring surgery. And the female to male ratio is 4 is to 1. What are the causes or etiology of gallstones? Okay, the classical teaching lists six important causes fat, fertile, flatulent, female, 40, and family history. Okay, these are the six classical uh, causes of patients with high risk for developing uh, gallstones. Okay, this diagram shows you the four important conditions, predisposing conditions to developing of gallstones. First, impaired gallbladder function, impaired emptying, absorption or excretion. Second, supersaturated bile, eh? and this is usually due to a concentrated bile due to age, sex, genetics, obesity and diet. Thirdly, you have got cholesterol nucleating factors such as mucus, glycoprotein and infection which predisposes to the formation of gallstones. And lastly, the fourth group will be the absorption, enterohepatic circulation of bile acids. Eh? So anything goes wrong in this absorption or the enterohepatic circulation of bile acids will predispose to high, higher incidence of gallstones. Okay, now the stone formation. If, uh, Pulse salts and lecithin keep cholesterol in solution. Okay, this is very, very important. Eh? When the stability between these components is lost, either due to excess cholesterol, reduced bile acids or reduced lecithin, then okay, excess cholesterol, reduced bile acids or lecithin, then gallstones will form. And the bile under these conditions is known as lithogenic bile, high tendency to form gallstones. Okay, this chart here or the graph here shows you the tendency to form gallstones. Normal patients, the cholesterol is kept in solution in, in this grey uh, bluish shaded area here. Okay, and this is due to decreased cholesterol increase lecithin and decrease bile, bile salts. When these conditions are, are present or favorable, then the cholesterol remains in solution. If, on the other hand, the cholesterol in increases, bile salt and lecithin decreases, then the bile goes into this solution here, red area, and this is where Lithogenic bile is conformed, and this is where cholesterol zones come in. Okay, lithogenic and safe zone. Okay, gallstones, there are three types. Cholesterol, stones, pigment stones, and mixed stones. Pigment stones are black and brown, depending on the color or con and the cause. This is hemolytic jaundice, pigment stones, and this is due to infection such as presence of foreign body in the bile ducts. All of them contain cholesterol in different concentration. Cholesterol stones, more than 80% cholesterol. Pigment stones, less than 30%. And mixed stones, 30 to 50% of cholesterol. Okay, what are the complications of gallstones? Okay, complications of gallstones can be due to two scenarios. Eh? The first scenario is when the gallstone is within the gall, uh, gallbladder, okay, and this is the gallbladder stone, okay, and this stone leads to complications related to cholecystitis, the inflammation of the gallbladder. Second group of condition is due to cholecystitis or stones in the bile duct, and this leads to secondary obstruction of the bile ducts, okay. And this secondary obstruction leads to cholangitis, liver abscess, and biliary cirrhosis. And all these 
lead to obstructive jaundice. The other complications of gallstones will be in general biliary colic, acute cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis. It can also lead to complications of acute cholecystitis, which are mucosal, empyema, and perforation of the gallbladder. Obstructive jaundice, acute cholangitis, and liver abscess are complications of cholecystitis leading to obstruction and jaundice. The other complications include Mirizi syndrome, intestinal obstruction due to gallstone ileus or carcinoma of the gallbladder. And these complications are basically due to chronic cholecystitis. Now we come to the first disease, acute cholecystitis and biliary colic. Okay. The most important cause of this is gallstones. Huh? And these gallstones in 95% found impacted in the Hartman's pouch or the cystic duct. The types of gallstones are usually mixed, most common as pure cholesterol stones and pigment stones. The bacteria usually associated with this infection of with these gallstones are bacteria are usually gram negative aerobes such as E. coli, Klebsiella, and Strephicalis. There can also be anaerobics of important cause these days, which is bacterioides and Clostridia in this gas forming in the biliary tree. And this forms the basis of the use of scaphylosporin and metronidazole in the treatment of acute cholecystitis. Okay, now we come to the pathogenesis of acute cholecystitis. This can be described in five stages from one until five. So what happens is the first stage is the gallbladder, the gallstone gets impacted in the heart and pouch of the cystic duct. And this is followed by obstruction and erosion of the lining of the gallbladder. With this obstruction, the second phase comes in, that is increased intraluminal pressure. And this intraluminal pressure increase causes a distension of the gallbladder. Okay, at this stage, the patient feels pain, and uh, typically the pain is visceral in origin and is vaguely located, ill-defined, with nausea, vomiting. There's not much guarding, and the Murphy's is usually negative, and these are the features of biliary colic. And at this stage, if the stone continues to remain obstructed, then the inflammatory process continues on with edema. Okay, the wall becomes edematous and ischemic, and this at this stage the patient feels increased pain, and this pain is of somatic origin, which is localized, the severe tenderness and guarding, with Murphy's positive, and these are all features of acute cholecystitis, which is due to the acute inflammation of the gallbladder. Next, we come to the clinical features of acute cholecystitis. First, sudden onset of right hypochondral pain associated with fever, nausea, vomiting, and tachycardia. And on examination, there will be tenderness and guarding over the right hypochondrium. And the BOA sign which is an area of hyperesthesia between the right ninth and down rib posteriorly may be positive. So is Murphy's sign, which may be positive, which is the sudden holding of breath on deep palpation of the right hypochondrium. Having said this, I must highlight the importance of the absence of signs in patients who are elderly and immunosuppromised. Okay, in these patients, there may be uh, minimal or no signs, especially pain and uh, fever in patients with acute cholecystitis. Okay. This uh, slide shows you the various symptoms of uh, cholecystitis. This is the one, upper abdominal pain. Okay, This is each time there comes an acute pain, it's known as a gallbladder attack. That's when the stone blocks the movement of bile from the gallbladder to the cystic duct. 
Most of the time, the pain is localized to the right hypochondrium, where at times it can radiate to the left as well, to the back and to the right shoulder. Okay, here you see right hypochondrial pain with that radiation to the right shoulder. Here, right shoulder deep pain, which is a ref uh, referred pain, and the boa sign, which is an area of hyperesthesia between the 9 and 11 ribs posteriorly. Okay, next we come to Murphy sign, huh, which may be positive in a patient of acute cholecystitis. Okay, how to release it? Place the hand below the right costal margin here, like as it is here, alongside the mid clavicular line. Ask the patient to breathe deep and the patient experience, experiences pain at the peak of inspiration. And so he stops or halts the breathing and that is Murphy sign. Okay, there may be a number of other ways of demonstrating this, but basically it is applying pressure at the right upper corner region where the gallbladder descends on deep inspiration to hit your end and cause pain. Okay, so whilst applying pressure in the right upper chondrium, ask the patient to inspire, take a deep breath. Murphy sign is positive when there is a halt in inspiration due to pain, indicating an inflamed gallbladder. This can be more accurately achieved with an ultrasonic probe, namely, and is known as sonographic Murphy sign. Okay. Now, what are the investigations that you do for these patients with acute polycystitis? First, you do a plain x-ray of the abdomen, chest, erect and abdomen with an ultrasonograph of the abdomen. Okay, This is the mainstay of investigations. Next, we come to the CT scan if necessary, MRCP and ERCP. Other investigations which may be done or which could, should be done will be an ECG to rule out ischemic myocardial infarct, urine analysis to make sure there's not a urinary tract infection, full blood count, liver and renal function tests, including serum amylase and cardiac enzymes if necessary, especially looking for creatine, creatine kinase, creatinine kinase and troponin T. Okay, this is an ultrasound, which I told is one of the main investigations. It shows a gallbladder okay, with a uh, hypoechoic shadow here, which casts the posterior shadow, and this is diagnostic of gallstone within the gallbladder. Okay, this one, a normal, uh, this is the features of an acutely inflamed gallbladder. But the gallbladder, there's a stone in the neck of the gallbladder. The wall is taken, gallbladder wall is taken to more than 2 millimeters of uh, diameter and there's pericystic, pericolicystic edema fluid suggesting it is inflamed. So these three features, presence of gallstone, thickening of the gallbladder wall and pericolicystic fluid are three features that suggest the gallbladder is acutely inflamed. Okay, gallstone, thickened wall, pericolicystic fluid. Now, the differential diagnosis of acute cholecystitis, common acute appendicitis, perforated peptic ulcer, acute pancreatitis, acute gastritis, and acute gastroenteritis. These are all the common differential diagnoses for acute cholecystitis. The less common ones will be acute pyelonephritis and right urethral colic myocardial infarction and pneumonia of the right lower lobe. Complications of cholecystitis. This include empyema of the gallbladder, which is the gallbladder becomes filled with pus, perforation of the gallbladder with bile peritonitis, leading to sepsis and septicemia. Recurrent attacks of acute Inflammation can lead to chronic cholecystitis, extension of the infection into the liver, where the gallbladder is closely associated with, leading to liver abscess. 
which is shown in this diagram, a collection of pus within the gallbladder due to obstruction of the neck of the gallbladder. And this is called empyema of the gallbladder. Okay, and uh, usually these patients are unwell and often septic looking and they are associated with significant morbidity and even mortality. The condition empyema of gallbladder is diagnosed with ultrasound and in this case it may need a CT scan as well. And treatment is via laparoscopic cholecystectomy. In ill patients who are unsuitable for surgery, an initial percutaneous cholecystostomy can be done to re release the pus from the gallbladder. And when the patient is suitable or fit, then we send him for elective cholecystectomy. Treatment of acute cholecystitis. Initially conservative followed by cholecystectomy. Okay, usually the conservative measures include keeping the patient near orally, nasogastric aspiration if necessary. Analgesics are usually required, and as well as antibiotics, broad spectral antibiotics, together with intravenous fluids to correct the electrolyte and fluid imbalance. The definitive treatment is cholecystectomy which can be done as an emergency or an elective. Okay, emergency preferably done laparoscopically within the first two to three days after the initial treatment if the patient fails to uh, improve on conservative treatment. Elective surgery is always the treatment of choice which is done after six weeks. An initial treatment, patient is stabilized, is discharged and brought back after six weeks or an elective laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So the treatment is conservative treatment followed by elective cholecystectomy. Next we come to chronic cholecystitis which is due to a repeated inflammation and mechanical irritation of the gallbladder by the gallstones within it. Okay. Usually, there is recurrent attacks of cholecystitis lasting for weeks or months and almost always is due to gallstones. As a result of this recurrent infection and inflammation, the gallbladder becomes shrunken, scarred, fibrotic, with thickened wall and non-distensible. Okay, this is very important, eh? non-distensible, which is, accounts for the uh, covacia sign. At times, chronic inflammation leads to calcified uh, cal gallbladder. The whole gallbladder becomes calcified, known as your porcelain gallbladder. And usually, there is a lot of additions of the gallbladder to the surrounding structures, especially the duodenum and the liver, which makes cholecystectomy a difficult operation in these patients. Clinical features of chronic cholecystitis will be chronic recurrent right hypochondrial pain, associated with nausea and vomiting, abdominal fullness, especially precipitated by fatty food, flatulent dyspepsia, belching, bloating and heartburn. And in these patients, male free signs may be positive. Eh? Often they are negative, but at times they may be positive. Now, the complications of chronic cholecystitis. This recurrent inflammation of the gallbladder leads to the formation of a cholecystoduodenal fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum. And gallstones from the gall, uh, gallbladder may pass through into the small bowel of the duodenum through this fistula. Heck, the consequences bowel obstruction can occur. Okay, here you can see the gallbladder, the duodenum. There's a fistula here due to chronic irritation and erosion. There are gallstones pass into the duodenum. Okay, and this can cause a cholecystoduodenal fistula. Okay, and uh, as a consequence of these stones passing into the duodenum, you have obstruction. The first one is known as the Bowlett uh, syndrome. 
which is where the stone impacts in the duodenum and causes gastric outlet obstruction or goo. Huh? And this is with persistent vomiting. More often, the gallstones from the duodenum pass through the small intestine and get impacted at the terminal ileum, which is the narrowest part of the small intestine. And that causes small bowel obstruction. And this is known as the gallstone ileus, which is more common than the duodenal and gastric obstruction. Now, what is Mirizi syndrome? Eh? Okay, this is a picture showing you the gallbladder, a stone in the neck of the heartburn voucher or sometimes the uh, cystic duct. And this due to chronic inflammation, it causes obstruction of the common hepatic duct. Okay, obstruction of the common hepatic duct, which can lead to jaundice. Okay, so this is a stone located in the heartburn voucher and causes obstruction of the adjacent hepatic duct, common hepatic duct. Okay, you can see a common hepatic duct, stone in there. This results in obstructive jaundice. And diagnosis is usually confirmed by MRCP or ERCP. Okay, and in this case, patient is jaundice, so you may have to do, you have to do MRCP or a ERCP. And the treatment is once confirmation is laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Treatment of cholecystectomy, chronic cholecystectomy is con can be classified as conservative, which consists of chemical dissolution using perso deoxycholic acid and keno deoxycholic acid. And lithotripsy, where the stones are broken down by ultrasonic waves and put this uh, found to be the success rate is very, very not so significant. It's very minimal, and the, and takes a uh, very long term treatment. As a result, these conservative treatments are usually given way for surgical treatment, which is cholecystectomy. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the treatment of choice for chronic cholecystitis. Whereas in open cholecystectomy may at times be required due to massive adhesions. And this is usually done through a right hypochondrial incision known as caucus incision. Okay, this is a caucus incision, a uh, costal margin here. So this is your caucus incision. Okay, now we come to another important topic called bile duct stones or cholecholic acids. As I told you, the gallbladder here is connected by the cystic duct to the bile ducts. The main bile duct is the common bile duct here and the common hepatic duct. Okay, this is the CBD which contains stones. Okay, so most of the time these stones are usually uh, secondary to gallstones. That means 90% of the stones come from the gallbladder. But there are 10% of stones, especially pigment stones, which develop primarily in de novo, de novo in, the gallbladder, in the bile ducts. Huh? In these patients, there are no gallstones. Okay? So the CBD and the common hepatic duct, there may be stones. And these are known as the primary uh, gall, uh, gallbladder uh, bile duct stones. And in these patients, the stone in these bile ducts cause obstruction leading to jaundice. Okay, they develop pain, uh, pain, jaundice and fever. Okay, which are class, uh, classified as the trat charcot striate, which is a diagnosis of infection of the bile ducts due to obstruction by gallstones. Okay, and this obstruction leads to stasis and secondary infection and jaundice. In addition to this, there's one more condition known as the renal spentat, which is in, in addition to the charcot striate, there's also hypotension and mental symptoms. And these are features of ascending cholangitis and renal striate may be an indi indication of impending uh, septicemia and shock. 
What is ascending cholangitis? Ascending cholangitis is due to infection of the bile duct due to obstruction and stasis of bile. And the most common obstruction is CPD, stones in the common bile duct. Okay, you develop fever, abdominal pain, and jaundice, which we call a charcoal striate. Then, if the suction continues, then you develop renal spenta. In addition to the charcoal striate, there is confusion and hypotension, which is usually due to sec secondary bacterial infection. Okay, and this is an early sign. It may be an early sign of septicemia and shock, impending shock. Now, the, under the, the uh, continuing with the diseases of the bile duct, next is bile duct stricture. A bile duct stricture is an abnormal narrowing of the common bile duct. Okay, so these are the common bile ducts, abnormal narrowing of the common bile ducts. Huh? The common bile duct, the bile ducts can be divided into an intrahepatic bile ducts and extrahepatic huh? within the liver and outside the liver. Okay, within the liver are the intrahepatic ducts. The extrahepatic duct consists of the common hepatic duct, the cystic duct, and the common bile duct. The narrowing can be due to benign or malignant strictures. Okay, these are the parts here, extrahepatic ducts. Huh? There's narrowing here. Okay, now what are the benign strictures causing uh, bile duct strictures? Okay. The most common cause is the passage of gallstone, okay, which is the most common cause, and uh, this causes minor su superficial injuries to the lining of the bile ducts, and later they develop strictures. The second other cause will be post cholecystectomy, injury to the bile ducts during this operation, either open or laparoscopic. Infection of the bile ducts, post cholangitis leading to strictures and ERCP manipulations such as spinterotomy and stenting of the common bile duct. This is becoming more and more uh, commonly done and so forth. The strictures are also more common. Other conditions include trauma to the bile ducts, foreign bodies in the bile ducts, stents and parasites, inflammatory disease of the bile ducts such as sclerosing cholangitis, and congenital conditions such as Carolis disease, biliary atresia, and cholelocalsis. Now, the second group of uh, bile duct strictures are known as the malignant strictures, okay, where there is an intrinsic obstruction of the duct due to tumors primarily in the bile duct, okay, the bile duct tumors. Two main groups of diseases will be the cholangiocarcinoma and the ampullary carcinoma or very ampullary carcinoma. Then there is the extrinsic compression of the bile ducts due to some form of neoplasm in the adjacent organ such as gallbladder cancer and pancreatic cancer, especially the head of the pancreas and liver cancer. Okay. And the commonly these three conditions in green indicated in uh, green are the triple cancers of obstructive jaundice, cholangiocarcinoma, ampullary carcinoma, and pancreas, uh, pancreas, which among the three is the most common. Next, a few words about gallbladder polyps. The gallbladder polyp is a small abnormal growth of tissue with a stalk protruding from the mucosa into the lumen of the gallbladder. It is a common condition. 95% of them are benign and rarely they become cancerous. Nowadays, it is found the size is an important parameter that must be considered in its uh, potential to become malignant. Okay, the size is often an indicator to the presence or the possibility of cancer developing in the polyp. And the critical size is uh, 10 millimeters. Huh? Polyps less than 10 millimeters in diameter are typically benign and don't need to be treated. Whereas polyps more than 10 millimeters in diameter, greater likelihood of becoming malignant 
and in these patients a prophylactic cholecystectomy would be advised okay those polyps with no symptoms and are less than 10 millimeters the treatment is regular follow-up and cholecystectomy if it goes beyond 10 millimeters This is a ultrasound showing you a gallbladder polyp here. This is a, a gallbladder, multiple hyperacogenic shadows. These are polyps. They are not gallstones because they don't cast posterior shadows. Okay, and these are yeah, posterior shadows. And these are the operative specimens showing multiple polyps within the gallbladder. Cancer of the gallbladder and bile ducts. There are three main ones that are of importance. Okay, firstly is the gallbladder cancer. Second, cholangiocarcinoma, a cancer of the bile ducts. And thirdly, periampullary carcinoma. Okay, is carcinoma of the duodenum surrounding the ampulla. Okay, gallbladder cancer is a very rare, very rare occur in elderly women about 60 years of age. Similar presentation to gallstones, especially chronic gallstone disease. Diagnosis is by ultrasound and CT scan. And most patients present with advanced disease. Surgical resection is in less possible in less than 10% of patients. And majority of them, more than 90%, uh, not suitable for uh, surgical treatment and given palliative treatment. Prognosis is poor. The median survival rate is uh, approximately six, six months. In this respect, one important factor to consider is prophylactic cholecystectomy for any gallbladder polyp more than one centimeter in diameter, whether symptomatic or otherwise. This will selectively remove the cholecystectomy prophylactically to prevent it from becoming malignant. The second group is cholangiocarcinoma, which is also an uncommon, elderly more than 65 years of age, is adenocarcinoma from the bile ducts, which can be either extrahepatic or intrahepatic, and these are the risk factors for developing the tumour, primary sclerosing cholangitis, hepatolithiasis, hepatitis C, ascending cholangitis, cholidocalcis and Carolis disease. Location of these tumors can be either intrahepatic or extrahepatic. Intrahepatic, 10 to 20 percent of tumors are intrahepatic origin. Majority of them, 60 percent, come from the hyalocholangiocarcinomas, or also known as Klaskin tumors. And tumors from the distal bile duct account for 20 to 30 percent. The periampullary cancer consists of four, four groups of tumors. Eh? First is ampullary cancer from the ampulla of butter, cancer from the lower end of the common bile duct, cancer lower from the lower end of the pancreatic duct, and cancer of the duodenum. Okay, these are the four tumors which are collectively called periampullary cancers. Prognosis in these cancers is generally poor. The cancer of the head of pancreas and ampulla of water must be clinic, uh, histologically differentiated because ampulla of water cancers generally have better prognosis and are more amenable to uh, vipuls or total pancreatic duodenectomy. The diagnosis is confirmed by ultrasonic, uh, ultras, uh, endoscopic ultrasound with biopsy, eh? EUS with biopsy, and the treatment, if operable, is pancreatic duodenectomy or Whipple's operation, or the pyloric preserving pancreatic duodenectomy. Okay. In general, all the three malignant tumors which I mentioned have certain common features. Eh? They are rare. Elderly patients above 60 years of age. Clinical features similar to chronic gallstone disease. They all present with obstructive jaundice, deep obstructive jaundice, 
which is often painless and that is usually associated with marked pause of weight and anorexia and the patients are usually emaciated. And th these tumors in general present very late by the time they are detected, it is already advanced. Pro prognosis on the whole is also very poor. Most of them do not survive uh, more than a year. And they, do, they are not suitable for curative. Only palliative surgery or treatment is possible. And in the form of chemotherapy, target therapy or radiotherapy. Okay, now con talking about obstructive jaundice and pancreatic and tumors that cause obstructive jaundice, this law is very important and it must be understood very carefully. Okay, this is a patient who is jaundice and a gallbladder that is palpable, huh? that is enlarged gallbladder here. Okay, now this law says in the presence of obstructive jaundice, a palpable gallbladder is usually not due to gallstone obstruction of the common bile duct. Okay, so that is the meaning. So if the gallbladder is palpable, this patient is unlikely to be due to a stone obstructing the CVT. It must be due to some other causes, such as carcinoma head of pancreas, periampillary tumor, and cholangiocarcinoma, which I just went through recently. Just went through. Okay, this is, and I call it the triple cancer of obstructive jaundice. Why is it so? Because gallbladder is usually fibrotic and contracted in cholecystitis uh, with gall, uh, due to stones. So once the patient with stones, they tend to have chronic cholecystitis. The gallbladder is unable to dilate. Therefore not palpable. But there are exceptions to this rule. There are two main exceptions. Primary CBD stone, as I told you just now, 10% of stones are known as primary, occur in the bile duct without any stones in the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is virgin. The second one is double stone obstruction. Stone in the CBD plus a stone in the cystic duct, causing the gallbladder to be distended to become even a mucosal uh, of the gallbladder, which then becomes palpable. Okay, now the final part of the topic is on cholecystectomy. Okay, and the indications will be, these are the two more com common, cholecystitis and chronic cholecystitis. Others are complications of the disease, and pyema, perforation, carcinoma of the gallbladder, and porcelain gallbladder. The last of these I put here, asymptomatic gallstones. Okay, and this, and generally asymptomatic gallstones, no surgery is necessary. Huh? Just follow up and observe the patient. However, in patient with diabetes or patient with polyps, you may consider prophylactic cholecystectomy for these patients especially for diabetic patients because in diabetic patients if the patient develops acute cholecystitis the chance of complications is much higher and they tend to be more serious okay cholecystectomy there are two forms laparoscopic which is the most popularly done these days and is the method of choice and open cholecystectomy through a Caucus subcostal incision on the right upper quadrant. Minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery is less painful, less infection, less complications, faster recovery, but more costly. So, in general, lap laparoscopic cholecystectomy is the treatment of choice these days. Okay, this is the method of uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. First step, mobilizing the inflamed gallbladder, identifying the cystic duct, clamping, clip, clipping at the cystic ducts, okay, 
and then the cystic duct is cut, transected using scissors between the clips. Once this is done, the cystic artery is mod uh, mobilized and similarly clips applied and cut by the cystic duct. Then a gallbladder is mobilized from the liver bed using diatomy and the gallbladder is delivered to the port, one of the pots. And this is the gallbladder that has been opened up, revealing multiple stones in it. What are the complications of polycystectomy? Bleeding, hematoma, infection, wound infection, infection, intra-abdominal infection, cholangitis, liver abscess, subhepatic abscess, septicemia, bile duct injury, bile leakage, bile duct strictures, retained stones in the CBD which are unrecognized, okay, obstructive jaundice, acute pancreatitis, fibrotic gallbladder, and embedded gallbladder causing difficulties in this operation. And last but not least is the called post cholecystectomy syndrome. This is a group of symptoms that of the gall, uh, gallstone disease that continues even after removing the gallbladder. The actual mechanism is not understood, but fortunately, these symptoms are usually self limiting. Huh? And within a couple of months, they recover. Then most patients will recover from the symptoms. Okay, thank you for joining me for this uh, lecture. Thank you for your patience, and I hope to see you again in another lecture. Thank you.